morning. Let's join together in our call to worship. Brothers and sisters, we are loved by God, and we are chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. We have turned from idols to serve the living and true God. As we worship and pray together, may the Lord help our love increase and strengthen our hearts. The one who calls us is faithful. He will lead us, guide us, and give us strength. Let's pray. Lord, we pause from the busyness of our life to set aside time to worship you and you alone. Too often we are so self-consumed that we forget to thank you for all of our blessings. So many in the world do not have this freedom to openly worship you. And we lift up these Christians who are being persecuted around the world. Lord, we pray for healing and comfort to those with health concerns and who are in the process of grieving right now. May they feel your loving arms embracing them. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this space with your glory and love. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you in worship today. And we want to not only welcome all of you, but we have folks that are worshiping online with us as well. And we're so glad that you are here and a part of this worship service this morning. Our opening hymn this morning is number 73. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing God's power and God's love. Let's sing of God's power and God's love as we stand together. as we join our voices together in our affirmation of faith, which is the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, 
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Welcome to worship. If you would please fill out your connect cards which are found in the few pockets in front of you. Put your information on there. If you have any prayer requests, you can put those on there and you will turn the cards in with the offering. We have a few announcements for you. If you'll look in your books and you'll see today we have a volunteers meeting for all those helping out with Vacation Bible School. That will happen at 1215 in the Heritage Room. We have 135 children signed up for Bible School and I believe 63 volunteers, so it's a good group of people this year, especially two years ago, if you think back, we weren't even sure, I wasn't even sure two weeks before Bible school happened two years ago that we'd be having it in person, and we ended up having about 60 kids, so here we are back up to 135. All right, and then we have a garage sale August 12th and 13th. Please bring your stuff, but again, please wait until after VBS is over, that would help me greatly. Anything that you bring, we ask that you put a price on it before you bring it and uh, help support our Hispanic ministry with the garage sale. Also today during the Sunday School Hour, right after uh, this service, there is a book signing. Cherie Kotner, one of our uh, members of the church, has written a book. And uh, if you want to have your book signed, take it to her in the Heritage Room uh, at 945. Those are all the announcements we have. I want to ask that you stand up and welcome one another to worship, and I want to invite the children forward for their special time.
Good morning. What is this right here? A compass, that's right. So I have a compass app on my phone, and it's great, I guess. It'll tell you which way is which, which way is north, which way is south, which way is east and west, if you know which way you're trying to go. So if you want to go east, you will need to go that way, all right? If you want to go north, that way. That's good if you know where you're trying to go. Now, about 22 years ago, I went skydiving, and I had to land right here. Here's Skydive Houston, which is actually in Waller, which makes no sense. But they tell you, okay, you don't want to land in the lake. That would be bad. Okay, don't land in the lake. I'll try my best. Don't land right here because there's a Rottweiler farm. Okay, wonderful. But as they're telling you all this, I'm a first-time jumper, and I didn't know like how to control. They teach you how to do the controls to pull the things to make you go right or left, and you have to take a class. I went by myself, I jumped out with two guys were holding on to me, but once you pull the chute, they let go of you. And so you're there by yourself, except for a radio that's on your chest. And there's this guy who is telling me which way to go. And he was from South Africa, so he had a cool accent. But one of the times when, let's see, I was supposed to be pulling one of my, one of my little lever things, he says, go east, go east. You didn't give me a compass. I didn't know which way east was. And then I'm like looking for the sun. Okay, the sun's there, but I don't know which way east is from the sun. Oh, there's Atlanta over there. Maybe it's that way. I didn't know which way. He gave me the directions, but I didn't know which way the direction was. But I couldn't talk back to him because the radio could only go one way, my way. So I couldn't be like, hey, mate, I don't know which way east is. But he finally figured it out, and he said, pull with your left hand. Thank you. So he finally got me down, and he got me down right by the runway, which was good. So we can have directions, but it does us no good if we don't have the map or if we don't know which way those directions are sending us. We are blessed because God has given us a map of where we should go, and when we get away from that, when we get lost, God has also given us a spiritual compass, the Holy Spirit, to let us know, whoa, buddy, you got to go back that way on this map. You got to get back to the path, the one true path, of following Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Spirit could give us directions, but if we don't know even what path the Holy Spirit is telling us to go to, it doesn't matter much. So we've got to listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. We've got to know the map inside and out. So you need to be reading this so when the Holy Spirit tells you something, you know which way to go. My verse this week comes from John 16, Verse 13, and it says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. And help us when we get off track. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, before we uh, talk about congregational singing that we're going to do in a moment, I want to share with you, uh, Nyla Mutre is here today. Nyla graduated from Mumford High School, and I am so proud to say she's been accepted to the music school at Stephen F. Austin State University, and will be going here very quickly. Yes, she'll be going in just a little while to Nacogdoches, but today we have the opportunity here in a few moments to hear her sing the offertory, and I'm so very proud of her. She's been singing with choir um, this last semester, and, and I'm just uh, so thrilled that she's going to have the opportunity to go and continue her musical uh, journey, as it were, at, uh, at Nacogdoches.
sacerdotus, and so um, you'll get an opportunity to hear her in a moment. I tried to find a way to keep her here, but she wants to go to college, so I guess that's okay. You'll notice on your front cover of your bulletin today, a portion of our scripture is on the bulletin today. How can we thank God enough for all the joy we have? And as hard as life can be sometimes, God gives us so many things to be joyous about, to be thankful for. And every now and again, we just need to sing about that. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to sing His Eyes on the Sparrow. I've got peace like a river and joy like an ocean or fountain. And joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Let's stand, let's sing together.
always a lot of people to pray for. Yesterday, Jim Smith passed away, and now he's with the Lord. I want you to remember Jim Smith's wife, Jean, and their family. Lift them up in prayer. I do not know yet when the services will be held. But Tuesday, I'm traveling to Waco to do the funeral for Mary McDonald. Her husband, Mac, passed away in April. So I hope you'll remember the McDonald family. There's a lot of other people on our hearts always. When you get the prayer list, I hope you're praying for that. I hope you're praying right now during the prayer vigil of the church to pray about our discernment. Nyla, we're going to pray for you because you're going, you, you are going to Stephen F. Austin University. And we're proud of you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we're grateful to come into your house singing with joy. Joy that you've given us, joy that is a gift and cannot be taken away. You are the giver of our joy. And Lord, as we walk in you, we, we pray that you would keep us in joy. And we want to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Lord, on our heart is such joy because we have young people going to college and some are beginning jobs. And we pray for them. We pray for Nyla that you would bless her in all that she is going to do. Stir up the gift within her, Lord. Father, we lift up Jean Smith and her family. We lift up the McDonald family. We pray for your comforting grace in their life. We pray for our church. The Lord, I've declared a, a time of prayer and fasting so that we might seek your face, know your will, and then be obedient. And we pray for this time, not just at this church, but over 200 in this conference, Lord, we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit, and even in this moment of worship, that you would give us generous hearts, help us to know what it means to truly give like Jesus, and bless offerings, as even you teach us each day how to pray. Would you join me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So 
today's scripture reading is the first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. The word of God for the people of God. Daniel. Let's pray together the Bible verse that Jeff Jeff gave us today during the children's message. For the Lord, your word says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own but will speak whatever he hears and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Father, I pray for this verse to be real even in the preaching today of every word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let the church say amen. Come on, church, say amen. All right. I want to show you a video this morning of a person I've, I think a lot of in sports. He retired recently. He was a Super Bowl winning quarterback from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, Drew Brees. I want you to hear his testimony today because it's the reason he is who he is. So Cameron, would you show it? Sunday school, um, you enjoy hearing the, the, the Bible stories, and then you go uh, to, you know, the big the big sermon, the big church, and you sit there, and I'm just, you know, me and my brother just kind of hitting each other, just wondering when it's going to get over. <laughs> the second to last game of the season, third round of the playoffs, um, I was the starting quarterback. Um, I suffered a torn ACL in my knee. It was devastating devastating for me junior high school too this is when you're supposed to get recruited and just all of these things I had to wait to have surgery for a month because they had to let the MCL heal before they repaired the ACL and then I was still on crutches and it was just I'd hit that point I had seen friends have that injury and never come back quite the same so what I thought was just gonna be my life sports I felt like was being stripped away from me and I remember sitting in church on my 17th birthday and sitting in that same pew where my brother and I used to just goof around and never pay attention. And for some reason that day, it was different. And I was locked in um, on the pastor as he was sitting there talking about how the Lord was looking for a few good men to carry on his kingdom, to spread his word and to live the life that, that he had planned for them. And that spoke to me. And it was at that moment that I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and 
knew that there was something that was bigger planned for me than just sports. My fifth season, going into an off season in which I did not have a contract, I was going to be a free agent. I get hurt the very last game of the 2005 season with the San Diego Chargers. I've never dislocated anything in my life, but I knew exactly what happened. And I knew too that besides maybe like a broken neck or something, that that is the absolute worst injury that I could ever have asked for for a quarterback. As I'm walking off the field with my shoulder stuck like this because it was dislocated, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm probably never gonna put on a Charger uniform again. And then it hits me that, you know what, I might not ever play football again. A few short months later, uh, my wife and I were taking a visit to uh, New Orleans, uh, who was six months post Katrina. And we're just looking at the, the sheer devastation and just saying, I'm not gonna trust what I see with my eyes here because my eyes are telling me not to come here. <laughs> and yet my heart, my soul, the Lord is telling me that this is our calling. Uh, it's not about just coming to play football and be a part of the resurgence of a, a football team or an organization, but it's about the resurrection and rebirth of a city and we can be a part of that. We score, the Colts are driving, we get the interception, we go score, now we're up 14 with three minutes left, and yet you're still thinking, I know Peyton Manning, I know this this team. In your mind, you're going through all these scenarios of what you're going to have to do still, and then we get the ball back um, to basically take a knee to win the game, and it wasn't until that moment that, all right, we are world champions. As, as people, do we want to see and touch and feel in order for it to be real for us? And yet, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, I'll tell you, if we led by faith and not by sight, you know, so much of life is that. It's, it's faith in God, knowing that he's got a plan, and at times you don't understand it, and you're not going to see it, um, and yet you just have to trust and you have to have faith. Amen. Can y'all say amen? He said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by faith, not by sight. In this letter to the church in Thessalon Thessalonica, five different times in this short chapter, Paul says this phrase, your faith. It has to be your faith. That's why I wanted you to see someone who is well known as a believer he showed his faith not by sight but he had faith the Lord would do for him things that he had asked we're called to share our faith it has to be your faith can't be your grandparents faith can't be somebody else's it's got to be yours and what is it that we share it's Ephesians 2 for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast as I've been preaching through first Thessalonians this summer I've been focused on the key words and the key word today the key phrase is your faith many people now lump all religious people together and call them communities of faith. I don't like that. Is that a surprise? Are y'all awake out there? Am I sleeping in my bed and only dreaming that I'm preaching right now? Atheists have faith. Atheists have more faith than I do. They have faith that God does not exist. That's faith. Buddhists have faith. Buddhists believe they're going to be reincarnated over and over and over and over. You see, lumping everything together as communities of faith is really misleading because it tries to make all belief systems equal. And what that really is is putting faith in faith. We don't put faith in faith. We put faith in Christ. Amen? Amen? Our 
faith is in the Lord. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My faith is not in faith. It is in Jesus. The secular world has faith. Sometimes they call it positive thinking. Remember the children's book, The Little Engine, The Little Engine That Could. I like that book. It's children's book teaching that if you have positive thinking and you work hard as you go up the hills of life and you think you can, then you can do it. I believe in positive thinking. And yet, reality is, you don't always go up the hill. Sometimes you fall. Sometimes you don't make it. So I saw a cartoon the other day that I thought was more appropriate for a new book. I thought I could. I thought I could. I thought I could. Sometimes that happens. So when things don't work out, do you just give up on faith? Of course not. Your faith is in the Lord. You continue to put your faith in the Lord even when you don't understand all the trials of life. Like Drew Brees when he hurt both his medial collateral ligament and another ligament in his knee or when he dislocated his shoulder or when he lost a contract and he goes to New Orleans and they just had Hurricane Katrina and he pours his life into that community and becomes so well respected in New Orleans because he put his faith out there they knew that this was a man a godly man who didn't put faith in faith he put faith in the Lord our faith is in Christ because with God all things are possible amen Paul uses this phrase over and over your faith it's your faith I mean you got to make the decision about it nobody else can make it for you you have to do it you're responsible for it I read a true story this week about a man who recently went into the office of his priest he was weary he was distraught he was weeping. The priest knew this man, and the priest asked him, what seems to be the problem? And the man began to tell the priest about his life, the giant mess he had made of it. And the man said, Father, I have no hope. I've ruined my life. I have no chance of ever getting it back. And the priest leaned back in his chair, put a smug grin on his face, and he said, just have faith, my son. And then the man sat up in his chair on the edge of it and said, I would, Father, but I don't know what faith is. Tell me, what is faith? How do I get it? Why is it important? And the priest's smug look disappeared quickly because he didn't have an answer. Read this story written by the priest himself, Father Nehru, and he set out on a journey because at that point he didn't think he had faith himself and he was trying to give it to other people he told people they should have it but he couldn't even explain it he didn't even know if he had it himself but the, the priest went on a journey till he found it the Holy Spirit will always answer that prayer amen amen John Wesley, John Wesley once wrote to a young person struggling with their own faith, a young preacher. And this is his advice. Preach faith till you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. What if you were the priest that day and somebody asked you, what is faith? How do I get it? Why is it important? Well, the Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So I'm going to give you, in just a few minutes, the answer you need. 
but it's my answer. You have to find your answer, just as you have to find the voice for your faith. What is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, you're going to find that faith has two components. Number one, it is the assurance of things. Assurance conveys the idea that you have confidence, that you have trust. This is not confidence in yourself, though you should have self-confidence, but your confidence is in the Lord. Amen? The second part of this is that you have to have conviction of things that you don't see and trust that God will bring them to be. So when the assurances of God meet the conviction of the heart, then what is born is called faith. And when that faith meets the grace of God, we are born again, born anew. Wesley described it this way. Justifying faith implies not only a divine evidence or conviction that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, but a sure trust and confidence that Christ died for my sins, that he loved me, and he gave himself for me. There was a time in John Wesley's life when he was like that priest. He was like so many people. He grew up in the church, but he was asked about faith, and he didn't even know that he had it. And then he had a life-changing experience as he just sat there with a the Bible in his hands on Aldersgate Street, and he heard someone read the preface to the book of Romans written by Martin Luther. And on that day, Wesley said, quote, Assurance was given me that I, even I, am a child of God. That's, that is the heart of Wesleyan theology. God has given you the assurance of things hoped for, protection, security, peace, rest, strength, purpose, eternal life. There is no faith without conviction that the Lord is not just able to keep his promises, but that the Lord will keep his promises. So where does faith come from? Secondly, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. How do you obtain this conviction in the assurances and promises of God? The Bible says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. On five different occasions, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What Jesus is talking about is that your faith is found when the Holy Spirit confirms the word of God in you and you believe it. Faith is a gift that grows from the knowledge of the truth of God's word. Faith is produced like fruit is produced. If you have a fruit tree, and I just finished, I just finished my peach harvest, all 11. I didn't do much. I planted a peach tree. God produced the fruit. I had faith that what God created, he would bring to pass. Where does faith come from? It comes from hearing the word of God. That's why it is critical that you fill up your soul, your ears, your mind with the word of God every day. Lastly, why faith is important. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It tells you why it's important. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Did you hear me? Let me repeat that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Maybe when you came into the church today, you felt just like the guy who went to see his priest who had no answer other than a platitude. Why is faith important? I think St. Augustine gives us the answer. It is the very limits of our reason that make faith necessary. Reason alone 
never saved. The very limits of our reason make it necessary to have faith. Nothing is ever accomplished without faith and works. That's why the Apostle James wrote this in James chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Church, listen. If you say you have faith and you don't have works to prove it, then how do people know you have faith? Here's what one one person paraphrased this verse. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter, this epistle to the church in Thessalonica to encourage them. Five times he talks about your faith. How do you have it? How do you have it? I love what Martin Luther King Jr. wrote. Faith. Faith is taking the first step. Even. Even when you don't see the whole staircase. That is faith. Taking the first step. Even when you don't see the whole staircase. Y'all know I like humor to illustrate some things, and I'm going to end with a joke. It's one of my favorite jokes. There was a nun. Sorry for all the Roman Catholic references today, but there was a nun. (laughs) She was working at a home health care agency. She was on her way to visit one of the clients. She ran out of gas. She walked to the nearest gas station. She asked for one of those cans, one of those orange or red cans. They didn't have any. So she remembered, oh, yeah. I got something in my car that I, I have in case I need it. So she went and she took a bedpan and put about a gallon and a half of gas in the bedpan. She walked back to her car and she's filling up her car and everybody sees her and two guys walk by and said, lady, that's what I call faith. That's a hilarious joke. It doesn't really illustrate faith as much as it illustrates presumption because that's not going to get her car going. you got to have the right stuff. But the Lord has given us the right stuff. He's given us all we need. You came here this morning to worship God because of your faith. It's yours. Like Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, it's your faith in Jesus Christ that keeps you going every day. Your faith cannot be faith in faith. It cannot be faith in positive thinking. Your faith is in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ so that you have a love relationship with him that is life-changing so that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I'll leave you with this promise from Ephesians 3.20. He is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's faith. Trusting in that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for people today that are here that they might have their own faith. Have assurance that they are a child of God. And if they don't know that, then even in this moment, may there be a holy moment where the Holy Spirit draws them to a place to put their faith in you, that they might be saved right now. Lord, come into that person's heart. Forgive them of their sins. And those that are on the journey who are walking in the Spirit, and not walking in the flesh. I pray that you would increase their faith. Help them to stand upon your promises, that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But Lord, it has to be our faith, not somebody else's. 
there's a soul here today who's struggling with faith. I pray that your Holy Spirit bring them to that place in their life where they say, Lord, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Lord, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Lord, I pray this for my brothers and sisters today. In the name of Jesus, let all God's people say amen. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Will you stand? Let's sing together. send out your church. I pray for the gift of faith in this congregation that we might step out in faith and trust you. Trust you, Lord, to lead and guide us every step as we march on to Zion. We march on to heaven to see you. I pray that you would give us ever-increasing faith so that we stand upon your promise that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly what we could ask or think. Lord, bless your church. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let the church say amen.